Palestinian lives are being destroyed. Men, women and children are getting shot, beaten, run over, bombed and killed. Islam's third holiest site, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, has been raided, desecrated and its worshippers targeted. The story today is about the root of this issue, Zionism, a racist political ideology that gave birth to the State of Israel by legitimizing a settler colonial project in Palestine. This theory has turned into practice, and as the Zionist settler colonial project continues to expand beyond repair in the West Bank and Jerusalem, 70 years of occupation and coercive strategies on the ground, veiled by an irrational legal framework, have created a modern state of apartheid and human indignity spilling over onto your feet. They all seem so worried about the Palestinians. There's nothing to worry about. It's terrible. Do you like the racism? I like racism. Yeah. What do you think about the Palestinians not being able to walk along here? Uh, I don't really think much about it. It's because you don't think about other people? Or? Of course I do. And then how can you not think when they can't walk here and they can't get the bus? So let's start one by one. Zionism is a political and national movement aimed at creating and sustaining a Jewish state on Arab-Palestinian land in the Middle East. It was founded in 1897 by Theodor Herzl, who created the World Zionist Organization, and is mentioned by name in Israel's Declaration of Independence. Now, before we start going in on Zionism, and someone lies to you and tells you that I'm anti-Semitic, it's actually forbidden by God in the Jewish religion for Jews to establish a state until the arrival of the Messiah. Theodor Herzl was not the Messiah, but he went along and advocated for a Jewish state in Palestine anyway. Now, as we live in a world where a critique of Zionism is often equated with anti-Semitism, it is important to clarify the racist, supremacist, and colonial settler references that exist in Zionist thinking. After all, it was Herzl himself who wrote, quote, the anti-Semites will become our most loyal friends. The anti-Semite nations will become our allies. Just to clarify the relationship between anti-Semitism and Zionism. And here are the references, guys. David Ben-Gurion, Israel's first prime minister, said, quote, if we want Hebrew redemption 100%, then we must have 100% Hebrew settlement, 100% Hebrew farm, and 100% Hebrew port. Doesn't seem like this was destined for peaceful coexistence, eh? And this is what he thought of North African Arab Jews, by the way. Even the immigrant of North Africa, who looks like a savage, who has never read a book in his life, not even a religious one, and doesn't even know how to say his prayers either wittingly or unwittingly, has behind him a spiritual heritage of thousands of years. Mashallah, savage. Never read a book in his life. But hey, at least Mandem got heritage. On a serious note, the statement reveals how racial supremacy in Zionism is not exclusive to Christians, Muslims, and Arabs, but also to Oriental Jews, who are Arabs in culture, language, and descent. Racial supremacy was a repetitive issue in Ben-Gurion's Zionist ways. For instance, he explained how Jewish laborers should earn a higher salary because, quote, they were more intelligent and diligent than the Arab. These guys must have been taught biology all wrong, fam. And this idea was central to the Zionist ideology of Avidor Ivrit, which promoted exclusive Jewish labor in Jewish businesses. And the issue, well, most of these ideas have been used as a foundation for the establishment of Israel as a Jewish state. Now that we talked racism, let's move on to settler colonialism. Actually, there's more racism coming. If you don't know what settler colonialism is, it's a continuous process of land annexation whereby native inhabitants are removed and settlers from elsewhere are brought to occupy the land. On your phones, it looks like this. Jacob, you know this is not your house. Yes, but if I go, you don't go back. So what's the problem? Like, you are mentioned. stealing my house. And if I don't steal it, someone else is going to steal it. Or even like this. <laughs> and here, I think, a perfect example is the work of Zionist thinker and poster boy Vladimir Yabotinsky, who wrote The Iron War. No, seriously, that's what it was called. I know what you're thinking. We'll get to that later. Yabotinsky advocated that Israel should literally be built under the guise of an iron wall defense. He made parallels to the European conquest of North America and their genocide of the indigenous populations and how Zionists must do the same to the Palestinians without the expectation of ever reaching peace or some sort of agreement. There can be no voluntary agreement between ourselves and the Palestine Arabs. Not now, nor in the prospective future. Colonization can have only one aim and Palestine Arabs cannot accept this aim it lies in the very nature of things, and in this particular regard, nature cannot be changed. Like his other Zionist comrades, he was very clear about this feeling of superiority, but warned that Palestinians would resist, and advocated for using any coercive tactics necessary, including force, manipulation, and deceit, 
to achieve the objectives of science. Culturally, they are 500 years behind us. They have neither our endurance nor our determination. We may tell them whatever we like about the innocence of our aims, watering them down and sweetening them with honeyed words to make them palatable, but they know what we want, as well as we know what they do not want. Jabotinsky's iron wool went from pen and paper to this. And subhanAllah, just like that, Israel today boasts a big iron wool, keeping the apartheid intact. I mean, I mean the Zionism, Zionism intact. But you see what I'm saying about the connection of the ideology to what's happening on the ground now? Hopefully the connection is clear. To end this chapter on Zionism, I want to cite a powerful quote that I came across from another prominent Zionist thinker, Ahad Ahayim. He wrote in 1891 a pamphlet dubbed Truth from Palestine. The Jewish settlers treat the Arabs with hostility and cruelty, trespass unjustly, beat them shamelessly for no sufficient reason, and even take pride in doing so. A hundred years later, listen to the quote again. Look at this footage and tell me what has changed. And now let's talk about Palestine today. Israel's forceful evictions in the Arab-Palestinian neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah in East Jerusalem, the storming of the Al-Aqsa Mosque, illegal settlers attacking and killing Palestinians, bombing and laying siege to Gaza, it is all done in the name of Zionism, preserving the hegemony of an exclusively Jewish state and expanding its settler colonial project across the lands. And the worst thing about it is, it's all done in some irrational legal framework. For instance, if we take Jerusalem as an example, we find that if you're a Palestinian living in occupied East Jerusalem, you're subject to three legal criteria which can be used to revoke your residency. The first one is, Palestinians should not live more than seven years abroad and must not receive permanent residency or citizenship from another country. Secondly, Palestinians need to prove their center of life is in Jerusalem. And third, Palestinians should not be accused of breaching allegiance to Israel and occupying force. And so even if you don't leave, Israel has made it so that whether you like it or not, they can find a way to displace you. And they have indeed revoked the residencies of more than 14,500 Palestinians in occupied East Jerusalem from 1967 and continue to strive for an absolute Jewish majority in the Holy City. This is not to mention the hundreds of thousands that were displaced since 1948 and the millions of Palestinian refugees who were stripped of their legitimate right to return to their ancestral homelands. And it's not surprising because if the theories that founded the nation were racist and clear about an ever-expanding settler colonial project, why would we expect this to stop? Or not accept that what used to be a footnote in our vocabulary, which is illegal settlements, were and still are an indispensable part of Israel's very existence? And so, I honestly have a few questions to ask before we blame Zionism for everything. If you are a Muslim Arab leader, what have you done to alleviate the suffering of your Palestinian brethren? Do you accept the idea that Arabs and Muslims are backward savages unable to resist their own plight? Have you succumbed to the idea that Zionists are superior? Is there nothing more to do when Islam's third holiest site is being ransacked? Is the will of your people not enough for you to act? And if you are not Muslim or Arab, do you see any sign of humanity in the treatment of Palestinians that you see on your streets? Anything to be neutral about or unmoved by? What would you do if someone kicked you out of your house and drove over your family? and shot your mother and told you that it's all fine because you're a stateless and uncivilized. In 2021, as a global community, can we truly accept this and suffice ourselves with a few tweets? Have dignity and freedom lost all their meaning or do some deserve it more than others? As for the Zionists who celebrate fires, call attacks clashes and bombings of children retaliation, I will leave you with a quote from Ahad Hai. We are used to thinking of the Arabs as primitive men of the desert, as a donkey-like nation that neither sees nor understands what is going around it. But this is a great error. The Arab, like all sons of Sham, has a sharp and crafty mind. Should time come when the life of our people in Palestine imposes to a smaller or greater extent on the natives, they will not easily step aside.